Today we're going to talk about the surveillance bill that is one of the hottest topics in St. Louis right now. Can you please give us a little insight on Bill 185? Board Bill 185 is a bill that essentially looks at any surveillance technology that our police department would want to use, and it creates a community public input process for those bills and also adds a democratic component to it. So that that's very important what she just said. So one of the biggest things about the bill that, because uh, I went into the, one of the sessions yesterday, is that's accountability and um, transparency so the community can see exactly what's going on. Absolutely. Um, it's really important, especially in 2024, and especially given that we know as a city, we have very different priorities and values than our state legislator. And so it's important to remember that a lot of this is not just about the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department, but it's thinking about our different values. As a city, we've been clear that we stand for abortions. We've been clear that we support our undocumented the community. We've been clear that we support uh, folks' rights to get transgender affirming care, and our state has been clear that they're going to target those people at every chance that they get. So the importance of having a, a public process where alders can vote on and where community can give input and technology is we can make sure that we have those necessary conversations, that we reach a consensus, and that we don't put anything in place that could then be used to target groups of our population who we support and stand behind. And, and I guess we, I guess we can call that barriers. Absolutely, and I, I mean, I think more than barriers, uh, the great thing about democracy is this is what it looks like. You know, for anybody else within our city who wants to do anything, whether you're the mayor, whether you're the comptroller, whether you're the president, board of aldermen, whether you're an alder, we all have democratic processes that we have to go through. The police department should have the same rules as anyone else, and also it's really important because nobody catches everything. So the beauty of the democratic process is they don't have to, and experts in the community will be able to come in and testify. One of the things at the hearing is you heard someone who does surveillance and does that type of technology. The experts say, hey, it's very important that even though you might trust technology, you really need to make sure you're trusting people. And on another one, I read that you are big into mental health. Um, and we all know that mental health is, everybody's talking about physical health. Well, let's talk about mental health. So just real quick on another subject, because we're, we're talking to a professional. This is a pro here. Um, and I heard about triggers. You know, somebody told me something about triggers. I know that's one thing that people really need to understand what triggers your mental health episodes. Can you, like, give, give us a couple of tips just for the folks at home real quick about mental health and, and kind of gauging your mental I know I'm giving you a lot of questions. We only got a, lot of, a little bit of time with her. Um, give us a little bit of input about mental health and, and what people should look out for Bang. Yeah, so I think the most important thing that I want to make sure folks at home know in regards to mental health is just like you go to the doctor to get your checkup, you get a flu, you get a cold, you go get some symptoms, and you hopefully do some things preventive, your mental health should be the exact same thing. You should never carry any shame or any stigma for going and talking to a therapist or getting any medication if that's what you need. I think living in today's world is very difficult. It's hard. As human beings and growing human beings, we have to deal with a lot of things. And so as far as triggers, everybody's triggers are different. Um, Many people in our city, loud noises are triggers, and we hear our fair share of gunshots. So that might be something that you're working through. It might be triggering for you to see your state legislator target vulnerable groups of population. We just saw the state say that folks who are getting abortions shouldn't be able to access Medicare or Medicaid. That might be triggering for people who really believe in health care access. And so just normalizing these things, knowing that we all have struggles, that there's no such thing as anyone having perfect mental health at all times, and really taking advantage of fully resources that are available to you, and hopefully for any leaders doing everything that we can on our end to make mental health as accessible for folks as possible. And just, uh, same as plug, because, you know, people think you got to be 50 years old to care and things like that. You know, this is one, are you, are you the youngest older person right now? I am, I'm 28. She's the young, we're talking to the youngest older person on the board of aldermen right now. Yes. So to all of the young people out there. Yes, and I go to therapy every two weeks, okay? There's okay. no shame, there's no stigma in it. Obviously, the more that you do, the more that you grow, and it just crystallizes you not only as a woman, a leader, just as a human being in general. So I would say for all young folks out there, your communities need you in whatever ways you can step up. And sometimes the best way to show up for your community is to show up for yourself. I can't say enough. We just appreciate you, older woman. Folks, get involved. Please introduce yourself for the folks at home. My name is Sharon Tyus. I am now currently the older woman of the 12th Ward, but I started out in 1991 as the older woman of the 20th Ward. Then I became the older woman of the 1st Ward, and now I got elected in a larger when we went to from 28 to 14 as the 12th Ward. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. It's Women's History Month. Do you know the first woman 
to be president, I'm sorry, to be the mayor of the city of St. Louis came from the, the board of aldermen. Yes, that is true, Lida Cruson, right. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm excited, I'm excited. So let me calm down for a second. Can you tell us a little bit about what an older person does? So people think an older person is the person you go to for all the problems to, in the city. That is not the correct answer. So I start with that. They want to call you about dumpsters. And, and that is part of what I do to help people. But our primary responsibility is to promote and sponsor and vote on legislation. And legislation can really change your life. And I give a simple example of right now on Kings Highway, let's say the speed limit is 40 miles an hour, I can change it to 25 miles an hour, which it is already been changed to slow things down. Now that's just an example. I also sponsored the speed hump bill, which is much uh, looked upon and happy right now. Everybody's doing it. I didn't sponsor the original one, but I changed it so that we can introduce our own legislation and, and sponsor uh, speed humps in our own um, ward. Um, there's legislation right now on the table about excise. They want to change the the way you do excise, I don't agree with a part of it because I don't believe ever in taking away the right of the people to have a petition in plat. But that is something that's on, a, uh, on, on a, uh, our agenda right now. We also have some legislation about drones and about uh, uh, surveillance and the mayor's office. And so can we talk about that really fast about the, the, is it the what, surveillance bill that's going on? Correct. Right. So there's a difference between the mayor's office and members of the board about um, what is legal, what is not, and what you can prevent from happening. Um, so I'm just watching this go on and I'm reading the bills. I was here when we they tried to put drones in place before. Actually, my committee blocked it. I was the chair of uh, rules. And um, there's a real, really private uh, safety concern of just your ability to have your own space. And I look, I, I point to movie stars. Movie stars have people take, get these long lens cameras and take pictures of them. When you're in your backyard, you have some expectation of privacy, okay? If you're out in the streets, okay. But when you're in your backyard, you should not have people be able to jump over your fence or use lenses for that go feet, 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 and take pictures of you. So let, let's, let, let's talk about, because for all the folks at home, this is a lawyer here. Correct. This young lady is a lawyer, you know. Um, so let, let's, let's talk about the nuts and the bolts of it, because we do want technology to help us fight crime. We do. So how can we create a compromise? It's a balancing act, okay? One of the things, what um, um, the rule that, uh, the board bill that um, some other aldermen are sponsoring, it limits private companies from getting your uh, uh, information. And I agree with that. That's why we stopped the other bill. When you sell this, uh, or let the private companies do this and they gather all this stuff, and you can look at Google as a prime example. Google knows your whole life, okay? So um, if you're going to have that kind of thing, it should go through your police department and it should be some regulations. And the Board of Aldermen is also a check and balance on, we're the legislative body. The mayor's office is the executive body. The mayor's office wants to have total control. I don't care what the mayor is. But you really have to have a check and balance or you get an unstable condition in your community. This woman has been here the longest. And it's it, it, not to be funny, folks. It's, it's all about accountability. We really appreciate the hard work that our older people are doing to really go through the process and make sure that this is the best for the citizens of the city of St. Louis. And you should make sure that it's a fair access to everyone. You don't want to make laws that give certain privileges to other people while leaving other people out. And sometimes that's what people get so caught up in passing things um, that they're only catering to a few people. Excise, I, this uh, change in excise I heard was because a few people started complaining about, well, it's too hard to get a, a liquor license. Well, my take is that a liquor license is a privilege, not a right. And liquor, drunk drivers kill an awful lot of people. So we want to be very careful about who we're letting have access to liquor, especially late at night. Um, and that's why they have dram laws about making the bartenders responsible, about how much you serve people. So I'm not wanting to make liquor an easy, accessible thing. I want it to be a responsible privilege that you make sure that you are doing it in the right way and that you don't impede upon the surrounding residential communities. I'm so happy that we have older people like Sharon Tyus making sure that the city of St. Louis is safe. We just appreciate you, Sharon, uh, older woman Tyus, and Happy, happy Women's History Month. Thank you very much. I got to enjoy Happy Black History Month and now Women's History. And I, by the way, I'm a little history. I'm the first female attorney ever to serve at the Board of Aldermen. In 1991, I was the first one to be an attorney elected to the board. Please, for the folks at home, can you please introduce yourself? No problem. Rasheen Aldrich, Alderman of the 14th Ward.
So one of the biggest things that is the hottest topic in St. Louis is the surveillance bill. Can you please, and, and you're sponsoring the bill, am I correct? Yes, sir. Can you please give us a little insight on the bill and, and what the intricacies of it? Yeah, yeah. So it's really, you know, it's, it's been a lot of conversations, but it's, it's really a simple bill. It is about making sure that we have transparency and oversight in our surveillance technology. Uh, right now, we know our department use all different types of technology to keep us safe, which is uh, a good thing. We want to make sure our streets are safe. But at the same time, as we're working on a red light camera bill, we want to ensure that people have an understanding of what technologies are out there so it don't impede on their civil liberties. I'm not trying to stop the department from using that ne technology. Not not trying to have the department explain intricate, intricate details about it so bad guys can know about it, but so that people can know that, hey, these technologies out there, like we just, an article just came out of how shot spotters, and we see how shot spotters are only really deployed in North St. Louis and Dutchtown. They only deployed in like black neighborhoods, right? And the question is why? And if it is only deployed there, what is the success rate of it? So uh, the I think importance of this bill outside of making sure that people have oversight is also making sure that we don't just have technologies out here that are ineffective because those technologies mean that taxpayers are paying for it. And uh, another thing, can we talk about the difference between the red light camera bill and the surveillance bill? Because th these are two totally different things, correct? So, yeah, two totally different. So the red light camera bill is a bill that Alderman Shane Cohn is working on um, that will have a red light camera and a uh, speeding uh, element attached to it. So if people run through the red light, you'll get a ticket as well as if they speed through, you'll get a ticket. Now, Alderman Cohn, what I appreciate about him, he's being very intentional to ensure that it uh, stands up to the constitutional muster because it was ruled unconstitutional. How also do we make sure that we don't give people the wrong tickets? But you know, this board and under the leadership of President Green, we've been very clear. If we're going to do enforcement, we also are going to do oversight. So two different bills. As we get, if we as we bring more technology uh, to the city of St. Louis, we want to have oversight to make sure that these technologies are doing the right thing and not invading on people's privacy. So while we while we're giving while we're giving enforcement, which is important because again, we want to make sure our streets are safe. We just seen. A few weeks ago at the Drake concert, a young lady, you know, and her mother being hit uh, because there's a culture in St. Louis of just speeding. Even if the light is red, people run through it. You know, when I'm driving down the street, it's green. I still slow down or stop sign, right? So we want to put things in place to keep our streets safe. But at the same time, we don't want to put so much enforcement where the police department have so much power that if it's used wrong, that people don't have input in that process. No department, no entity. I mean, you hold your you hold your alderman accountable. Uh, we should be able to hold these different departments that taxpayers pay money to accountable too. And so, for the folks at home, I, I want to give them a little bit of background on you. So you 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 know a little bit about this uh, gentleman, and, and like, oh, this guy, I've never seen. T tell us a little bit about your work in Jeff City. Yeah, so prior to this, I just was uh, elected alderman in April. But prior to this, I was a state representative for the last four years in the uh, 78th district, which uh, was made up of neighborhoods of downtown, Car Square, Old North St. Louis, St. Louis Place, Hyde Park, but also went as far south to like Cherokee Street. So I served up there for four years in a super minority body, um, fighting Republicans, and ensure that a lot of things that they kept their hands off of St. Louis. And, you know, it, it was an honor to, even though I got beat up every day being super minority you know I learned a lot I learned a lot in the state house of n knowing how to negotiate and knowing how to compromise you know because in in this realm of politics you come up with an idea don't mean it's you gonna get all of that you got to build relationship with your colleagues you have to understand your community may be different from their community my community is different from theirs so instead of just you know saying no to them you know what is uh, what is that fine line of, you know, well, if I can't get everything, what are the key principles to ensure that what I'm trying to object actually gets done but also helps the greater good for everybody, not just Northside, but for the whole city of St. Louis or the whole state of Missouri? We're going to talk about responsibilities of St. Louisans here because um, what we just brought up, so the red light cameras and things like this, it can, still can't really prevent people from speeding in the city of St. Louis, can it? No. So, so what we have to do is change the culture. So really fast, in your mind, what can we do to, to make St. Louisans responsible? 
Yeah. I mean, you're 100% right. No matter how many red light cameras we install, that's not going to stop it. Will it be preventive? Yes. I think, you know, this board is also looking at measures of how do we change the way that our streets are, right? How do we change infrastructure? And it, like on Natural Bridge, you know, it used to be a flying type of uh, uh, a roadway. And, you know, narrowing streets down, putting roundabouts out, putting curb bump outs. What do we do? What can we do for infrastructure to really also improve the way that our streets aren't so dangerous right now? And I know the board is doing that but we can't do it on our own it's going to take the community to also understand that traffic violence is now becoming a pandemic when it comes to violence in general because it's it running a red light you're not only putting yourself in harm's way you're putting somebody else you're not only putting your vehicle harm's way you're putting somebody else's vehicle so like you say it's and i tell my colleagues that you know we are we can't rush to want to just do stuff because we see that it's a problem. We have to be smart about it, but it's also going to take, uh, the, like you say, the changing of the minds and the culture of St. Louis for people to know that like it's important to stop at a stop sign. It's important to stop at a red light because wherever you're trying to go ain't that important where you want to put your life uh, on the line. So it's going to take elected officials, but it's going to also take everyday people. It's going to have to take organizations. It's going to have to take churches. It's going to have to take mom and dad and auntie to say, this is the importance of your life and you don't want to lose it just trying to rush to get somewhere or the music turned up and you jamming and you like and that mood and that vibe like think twice because that, that one decision decision can kill you and kill somebody else. I think that is fantastic information from Alderman Aldrich. We really appreciate your sponsoring of Bill 185. You're watching Another Perspective. This guy, he really needs no, no, no introduction, folks. This is Gerald Christmas. This is one of the for me, one of the most fantastic attorneys that I've ever run into. So seriously, because you ran for circuit attorney. Tell us a little bit about that real quick. I ran for circuit attorney twice in, in 2000 and in 2004. And that was after I had worked in the circuit attorney's office for seven years. And after uh, D. Joyce Hayes had uh, resigned, she decided not to run for a third term. And so it was an open seat when I ran in 2000. And, and, Really quick, what did you do with Claire McCaskill, with Senator Claire McCaskill? Just to give you a little background on this gentleman. I was legislative assistant for Claire McCaskill in Washington, D.C. when she first went to the Senate. So I worked with her office the first three years that she was in the U.S. Senate. So what I, what I want to tell I just want to give you guys a little background on the gentleman before we go into stuff. I want to talk about a couple of cases that you've been that you've had the last couple of years. Um, one of them had to do with self-defense, and the, uh, the reason why I want to talk about it is it's a lot of people out there. Of course, everybody does their best to to not to get into a situation. You know what I mean? If, if you do get into a situation, as best they can. Um, Tell us a little bit about the case because I understand that the young lady actually had criminal charges brought against us, brought against her. But give us a little bit about that case. Well, she was in her own house. Someone came into the house and attacked her in her bedroom. Um, she was defending herself and she shot the woman that attacked her. And as a result of that, she was charged with an assault and an armed criminal action. And I argued from the very beginning that this was a self-defense case. She was defending herself in her own home. The prosecutor's office in St. Louis County saw it differently. Uh, we went to trial, and she was acquitted at trial by the jury. They saw it as uh, self-defense also. And the, the reason why I wanted to talk about that, folks, is do your best not to be in a situation. But this young lady was at home. And we have a castle doctrine in Missouri. You have the right to protect yourself in your own home. And clearly it was self-defense to me. I didn't think she needed to be charged. I had some issues with the office in the county charging her. I felt like she was being charged um, primarily because she was a African-American woman. And I think it's harder for the prosecutor's offices across the country to see the innocence in African-Americans. As we talk about that, we're going to go to another topic, and, and this has to do with a no-knock warrant. You know, a lot of people are, are familiar with Breonna Taylor, um, and I feel like it has to do around crime. You know what I mean? When you get crime, and you just feel like I can do anything I can to, to figure out a crime, which is, is terrible, especially in the African-American community. Just throw your civil liberties out of the way. Tell us a little bit about the no-knock warrant with the gentleman, uh, Mr. Don Clark, that you defended. Well, we currently are in litigation in that case now. Don Clark 
he was killed in a no-knock search warrant in 2017 before. He was before Breonna Taylor. Mm -hmm. We really could not get any traction in this case until Breonna Taylor was killed, and people really came to knowledge about no-knock search warrants. But he was a 63-year-old, 62-year-old veteran, disabled, uh, hard of hearing, and the police did a no-knock search warrant on his house claiming that they had observed drug sales happening at his house. What happened was they did a no-knock search warrant on three houses that night. The first house they went to on that block was a drug house. The next two houses they went to, with Don's house being the last house, were not drug houses. They did what's called a boilerplate search warrant where they just threw in some information that was unverified in order to get a judge to allow for this no-knock search warrant. And 17 St. Louis police officers in the SWAT unit busted into his house in the middle of the night and shot him dead. And we are suing the city now for his wrongful death. That, that, that is very disturbing. Very, very disturbing. And, and we're going to go, let's talk about something else. I really wanted to get you on, on your, your commentary on this. Right now, Bill 185 has to do with uh, police body cameras and technology uh, in, in the community. Are you familiar with that bill at all? I'm not right. I haven't read the bill, so I don't know it right off. I, I am for police cameras because cameras has helped us tremendously. But every time an officer is not going to have a camera on so just because they doesn't have they don't we don't have footage of it doesn't mean it didn't happen but having cameras has helped us tremendously and and, and that that is what i wanted to talk about using technology to help stop crime because i would would i would think that most people would want to stop crime wouldn't you I hope most people do want to stop crime. Most, most and i think most people 90 percent. i'm going to 90 percent of the people you know what i mean so Another question I wanted to ask you, how can we, because I talked to the different aldermen downtown, these technology we're putting in place, at the end of the day, they, they, they can't stop it. What can help us stop crime? Well, we have to work together as a community to stop crime in our community. We have to follow the principles of, of Kwanzaa, collective work and responsibility. So we have to work together to make our brothers and sisters' problems our problems and work together to solve them. Education is a big deterrent to crime. You know, the majority of my criminal caseload uh, have problems with reading and comprehension. So one of the things that we can do right off the bat is making sure that our children are getting early education before they go to school, preschool, preschool education. Public education is like oxygen for us. It's extremely important. And what happens is that these individuals, their reading skills are not developed, reading and comprehension by third, fourth grade, they realize that they're behind, they start getting into mischief, they start getting into juvenile activities. Then, you know, right past middle school, they start getting into more criminal activities, which can lead to more serious offenses. And then we have a lot of negativity being marketed, especially to our community. Uh, we have a lot of uh, gas stations that are selling a lot of drug and paraphernalia, alcohol, um, a lot of degenerative music is being marketed videos to our community specifically uh, with a lot of violence, a lot of vulgarity, a lot of um, sexual innuendo is being marketed. And we have to stand up to it. You know, and that's one of the biggest problems is us being organized and standing up to what's being marketed to our children. Uh, it's not by accident that a lot of our children are acting this way. It's because they're being programmed to act this way and there's not being any pushback to that. And we have to push back on the programming that's happening to our children. And then the other thing too is that all good school, schools have good parents involved and you have to be involved in your parents' school, I mean in your children's school. So you can't just drop your children off and not have any engagement in the school. You have to be engaged in what's going on in the school. You have to know the teachers. You have to know what's going on. You have to pop in and make visits. You have to volunteer to be involved in the activities. All that helps with, with having a good school environment which helps your children to be less likely to get involved in criminal activity. The reason why I brought this gentleman on the show is to get it from the, word, from, from the horse's mouth. Like you say, the caseload of his criminal cases. This, this gentleman has to go downtown and he has to defend the, 
the child that got caught selling drugs, the, cop, the child that got caught with his friends, playing around, you're robbing somebody. More time than not, as we just heard from a professional, they haven't graduated high school. They, they don't have any skills. That, the, the people that do have opportunities, you don't see. There are plenty of opportunities out here. We just have to make sure that we're putting our children in a position that they can take advantage of those opportunities. And what's happening is that we're not putting them in position where they can take advantage of these opportunities. And then you have to be a parent to more than just your biological children. You got to deal with all the children in the neighborhood. All the children in the neighborhood. All the children in the neighborhood, not, not just your children, because your children interact with all the children in the neighborhood. And so we want to make sure that we are raising an enlightened community across the board. So we want to get them involved, you know, and just finishing high school is not enough in this world now. You know, you have to have some type of skill set. So whether or not, you know, we need to bring the trades back into the high schools. We we, we took them out of the high schools. We need to bring those back in the high schools because many people can have their own business and their own career from learning a trade that they learned in high school. And we need to look back at that. Uh, not everyone is going to go to college, but college is a good option. Uh, the military is still a, a good option. There are other options out here. Uh, nothing is an overnight success. Everything takes hard work. And we have to learn to, to teach our children that they have to be disciplined and they have to work hard if they want to be successful. That's the bottom line. As you heard it, Attorney Gerald Christmas, the bottom line is parents, hard work, getting involved with the community. You're watching Another Perspective.